So I have a, a slightly provocative question to start off with. Uh, it's a little bit ironic. I'm the chair of the International and Global Studies program here at Brandeis, uh, but I'm actually very interested in nationalism. I'm very interested in uh, how nationalism still has a major role in the world today. Um, and so I have this provocative question that maybe we are all a little bit more nationalist than we think we are. Uh, and maybe we should pay attention to this when we're thinking about how global politics are organized and even how we uh, operate and function in our own societies. So as was mentioned, I uh, had a very sort of upfront and personal experience of nationalism uh, right after I graduated from college. I went out to Eastern Europe where uh, the great multinational uh, states like Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, uh, the former Soviet Union, were breaking up into these nationalist uh, elements. Uh, these are some friends of mine who were Bosnians who were uh, defending the city of Mostar uh, against uh, Croatian nationalists who wanted to take over the city. Uh, and I saw an awful lot of this during the wars in Yugoslavia and Moldova and in, um, as Czechoslovakia broke up. Uh, and it really seemed um, like a kind of primordial or, or you know, I instinctual uh, response that people were having in a moment of crisis, that they were sort of turning inward and turning toward each other uh, to, f to form or reanimate re um, these ancient bonds uh, in order to get through a crisis. Uh, and so in the 25 years since, we've had a lot more globalization, the globalization of the economy, um, the internet, a lot of uh, international travel, international student exchanges that have made uh, the world, made this experience of nationalism, this burst after the Cold War, seem like uh, sort of an anomaly. And that in fact, you know, we're moving towards a much more globalized world. Uh, and then came the past few years. And what did we get in the past few years? This total uh, reassertion of national identity. Um, the British deciding to leave the European Union. Uh, the Russians uh, reasserting themselves uh, in the former Soviet sphere with explicitly nationalist goals. Um, the Chinese uh, moving into the South China Sea in defiance of the United Nations. Um, India has a new, uh, very explicitly Hindu nationalist prime minister who talks quite explicitly about being a nationalist. Um, uh, Hungary, um, along with Poland, France, uh, Germany, uh, have seen the rise of right-wing nationalist parties. Uh, and in the United States, we of course have Donald Trump, who, um, like him or not, uh, has been very explicit about wanting to make America great again, about being a, of an American nationalist. And so maybe this nationalism that I thought had just sort of flared up 25 years ago is actually, there, there's more of it around than we think, and maybe it affects us uh, more than we might uh, want to admit, even ourselves. Um, now, as I said, when I saw nationalism flare up uh, back in um, Central Europe, um, it had this kind of instinctive feel to it, this kind of primordial feel, like a, like a tribal engagement of one side against the other. And I think that when we you know, think about nationalism or when we think about how human societies are organized, we often want to say, there's some kind of instinct behind this. There's some sort of biological basis for this. You know, we see ants organizing into uh, ant hills uh, very naturally. Uh, we see beavers form dams by instinct. We see wolves form wolf packs by instinct. You know, maybe our human societies, like nationalism, uh, is just a matter of instinct. That's very tempting. You know, we think we're rightly part of the animal kingdom. We think. Uh, maybe, you know, we're just, uh, we just experienced this ourselves. Um, and so we think that uh, we just have this instinct hardwired into our brains. We get some sort of stimulus from outside uh, and we all, you know, form to a society together uh, to respond to the world around us in collective action. But there's a problem with this, if you think about it. It's actually, a, it, it actually doesn't really work for human societies. Uh, and one of the ways we know it doesn't work for human societies is that human societies through history change much faster than their biology could possibly change, than human biology changes. You know, human societies have been evolving, to use a term, uh, have been changing, have been uh, uh, negotiated and overthrown and reconfigured much faster than by our biological change. You can see that if you just care, compare the timeline of a society that we know is based on instinct, uh, wolf pack societies, um, to human societies. Uh, 
wolves have been organizing, gray wolves in particular, have been organizing and hunting in wolf packs for as long as human beings have observed them. Um, they've, they've been observed by human beings for about 30,000 years. We think the gray wolf has been around for about 800,000 years. And certainly in all the time that human beings have been watching wolves, they haven't changed how they behave. They form wolf packs. Uh, our understanding of how wolf packs work has, has changed, but the, but the wolf packs have not changed. There's no new you know, democratic revolution among wolf packs. Um, a human society has actually been around a lot less time than wolf packs. You know, you know, large scale organized um, societies of the kind we see first emerging in Mesopotamia 9,000 years ago. And think about the diversity of societies that you've had in 9,000 years. Uh, you know, you've had theocracies, you've had large-scale empires, you've had colonization, you've had uh, communism, Nazism, uh, um, you know, various forms of fascism, liberal democracy. I mean, human beings are constantly changing their societies. Um, and so it would be very strange, you know, if our uh, biology were changing that fast, you know, if, if somehow our instincts were changing that fast. Um, in fact, I have right here a list of one of my favorite countries in the world, um, the Czech Republic. Um, the Czech Republic in just the past 150 years, there's a little green blip up there on the screen that represents the last 150 years. In the last 150 years, they've gone from being uh, under the Habsburgs to having a democratic uh, Czechoslovakia, um, to being occupied by the Nazis, to forming a communist government after World War II, um, then another democratic Czechoslovakia, and then breaking up with the Slovaks in 1993 and going their own way as um, the Czech Republic. Um, all of that changed in 150 years. The Czech, Czech biology hasn't changed that much in 150 years, right? The Czechs have no, don't have, haven't had their instincts rewired in 150 years. And so we have to look someplace else if we want to understand how our societies are formed. Um, and the place that we should look, the way we should think about it, is not that we have instincts, although we have some instincts. You know, we have an instinct to eat, we have an instinct to uh, procreate, but we don't have a lot of instincts for how to form a society. What we have instead are minds that are uniquely uh, organized to absorb a massive amount of cultural information that we then sift through as we try to figure out how our society should be organized. Um, things that we reflect on and understand in order to map our place in the world and our relations with other people. So society, what I'm telling you, is what Max Weber told us um, more than 100 years ago. Society is fundamentally cultural. It is, a, it is not a matter of instinct. It's a matter of a cultural creation that we participate in to or orient ourselves uh, in the world. Um, and if you think about society that way, you, it's sort of like the software of human beings then of course, you know, society can change quickly, even though our hardware, even though our biology doesn't change. Um, because we're uh, constantly you know, updating or changing that software that organizes us. We're constantly um, tweaking um, the, this culture um, that we use as a means of communication, a means of understanding each other. Um, so if we think about society as cultural, then we start to look at, okay, well, what is the culture of modern, of, of our modern societies? Um, it used to be, uh, well, before that, let me just point out that we need this culture. Uh, we need this because we don't have instincts. Uh, if we had instincts, we wouldn't need to be you know, constantly uh, downloading the software to tell us how to uh, orient ourselves. But in fact, if we don't have that software, uh, we experience what sociologists call anomie. Um, which is the sense of disorientation, the sense of not really knowing where we are, not knowing what we can expect from other people, not knowing what other people expect from us, an extremely uncomfortable position to be in. Nobody likes anomi. And human beings are um, designed to uh, move away from that as quickly as possible and to generate new cultural understandings of their position in the world, to figure out where we are. Um, so what... You know, where, how did we get to the culture that we now know? Um, it used to be that human societies were organized largely around religion. Um, that there was a sense that you know, the social order had been mandated by some sort of divine presence uh, and that you know, this social order extended out to the cosmos itself 
um, to root itself uh, in this uh, divine legitimacy. Uh, in medieval Europe, uh, that was uh, Christendom. Um, and so, you know, everything that happened in the political organization, social organization, was mediated through the culture of Christianity and through the culture of, of um, uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, and that became the common basis of understanding, you know. Uh, peasants felt like they could survive um, their uh, terrible treatment because this was just a veil of tears that human beings would pass through on their way to an eternal life. Um, that was the way you know, human societies were organized uh, for thousands of years, not just in Europe, um, but in Asia, and with Hinduism as a, a major uh, organizing principle of the subcontinent, uh, with Islam at the center of the Ottoman Empire. Um, you know, religion was the way uh, these social um, ideas, this culture was rooted. Um, for, uh, there's a long, complicated story of how that traditional society dissolved but it certainly did sometime around the 15th century in Europe. It begins to be undermined by um, secular ideas, by other ideas about political legitimacy. Um, and gradually, um, the divine mandate uh, is beginning to uh, fade away, is beginning to um, uh, dissipate, leaving, leaving that threat of anomie, leaving that threat of not, people not being oriented in the world. Uh, and so uh, all pr prompting um, a search, an exploration of a new way to orient ourselves, of a new foundation for societies. This is the age of revolution, right? This is the age of great change. Um, starting from uh, the 16th century with Henry VIII breaking England away from the Catholic Church and forming the Church of England. Um, the age of revolution going forward to the French Revolution, overthrowing the ancien regime that had been rooted in a Catholic sense of order. Um, ultimately up through the 20th century with the dissolution of the great empires, the Habsburgs, um, the Tsarist Russia, um, the uh, Ottoman Empire, all f collapsing and losing any sense of the divine right of kings, of a divine mandate um, for their rule, uh, and shifting instead to a totally new basis. Uh, to a foundation in nationalism. That our societies are now, these, this cultural conversation isn't organized around the church, it isn't organized around religion, it's organized around the people. And what the people want, all governments are supposed to have their legitimacy in serving the people. And the origin of our moral ideas or our values are supposed to be oriented toward our own national communities. Uh, among, among you know, these are the people whom we participate in a cultural conversation. It doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to other countries, of course we do, but the major conversation that we have, most, you know, most human beings on the planet are participating in a conversation that has the boundaries of a nation. There are some principles to nationalism. Uh, uh, all nations are different, all national cultures are different, but there are some foundational principles of nationalism, very well described by a wonderful sociologist um, of nationalism, Leah Greenfeld at uh, Boston University, has come up with this list of um, things that all nations seem to share, even as they uh, vary in their cultures. Um, we believe in popular sovereignty. We basically believe that if a government isn't at least paying lip service to the idea of serving the people, it's doing something wrong. And uh, even dictatorial regimes say they're doing, they're protecting their people, they're defending their people. Um, we believe in a certain amount of solidarity with our fellow nationals. Uh, we expect them to obey the laws, they expect us to, we expect them to treat us with some respect. Uh, and that goes to this third principle, it's very important, um, the idea of uh, fundamental equality within the society as members of the national community and getting a certain amount of dignity as a member of the nation. Now, all nations struggle with this idea of equality. The United States particularly has struggled, you know, through uh, decades of um, slavery, um, through, you know, the struggles over racial rights and, and uh, um, women's rights, and then the movement to acknowledge different forms of sexuality. We struggle to acknowledge that everyone has that equal dignity. But the fact that we struggle is evidence that we take it seriously. And nothing will get you on the, you know, page six of the New York Post faster um, than treating somebody, than some rich businessman, you know, treating somebody dismissively, uh, or some football star saying, you know, do you know who I am, trying to elbow his way into a club. Um, we expect to treat each other with a certain amount of equality and dignity within this, um, within this community. 
And nationalism, uh, the last thing I want to say about the principles of nationalism is it can be rooted in ethnic strife, it can be aggressive, it can be xenophobic, but not necessarily, I mean, not necessarily. Um, it can instead just be this sense of uh, having a place in your community among fellow equals. Um, the, one of the best expressions of nationalism that gives you a sense of its uplift and the, the sense of the power of what we're dealing with um, comes from the English, uh, from Shakespeare, one of the first nations, arguably the first nation, the first community organized as a nation. Um, and when Henry V in Shakespeare's uh, play uh, tries to encourage his soldiers to join him in uh, the fight in the Battle of Agincourt, um, he tells them, he, he quotes, um, makes a speech that's been quoted for centuries since, you know, as an expression of a kind of national sense of uplift uh, and dignity. He says, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile, this day will gentle his condition. Henry's not saying, get out there and fight for me, I'm your king, do what I want. He's saying, get out there and join me, my brothers, you know, my equals, uh, in this battle. You may be a very low status, you may be a vile, but this day will gentle your condition. This day will make you a gentleman. Um, and obviously today we would add sisters to that. Uh, we would um, expand the circle of equality. But that sense of dignity as a member of the nation is still very important. And that encourages me to think that um, Nationalism provides this sense of orientation, this sense of dignity, and probably isn't going away anytime soon. Yes, societies do change, but this particular formation that we have um, a place you know, oriented uh, through a common culture uh, with our fellow citizens, I would suggest probably isn't gonna go away. It just, it just feels too good. Um, it gives us too much of a sense of our uh, orientation in the planet and our relations with our fellow citizens. So to manage it, we should recognize it's probably not going away. Um, we should recognize that different nations have different operating systems, different cultures, and respect those differences. And even consider how the national culture, your own national culture, has had an effect on you. Because it, I tell you, it can be more powerful than you think it is. Thank you very much.